ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರ ವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾಬಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಮೇಧಾದೇವಿ ಜುಷಮಾನಾಗಾದ್ ವಿಶ್ವಾಚಿ ಭದ್ರಾಸು ಮನಸ್ಯಮಾನುದಮಾನುರುಕ್ತನ್ ಬೃಹದ್ ಬದೇಮ ಬಿದಥೆ ಸುವೀರ ತ್ವಯುಷ್ಟ ಋಷಿರ್ಭವತಿ ದೇವಿ ತ್ವ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗತಶ್ರೀತುಷ್ಟಿದ್ರ ವಿಂದತೆ ವಸುಸಾನೋ ಜುಷಸ್ವದ್ರವಿನೋ ನ ಮೇಧೆ ಮೇಧಾಮ ಇಂದ್ರೋ ದಾತು ಮೇಧಾನ್ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಮೇಧಾಂ ಮೇ ಅಶ್ವಿನಾಬುಭಾಧತ್ತಾಂ ಪುಷ್ಕರಸ್ರಜ ಅಪ್ಸರಾಸು ಚಯಾ ಮೇಧಾ ಗಂಧರ್ವೇಶು ಚಯನ್ ಮನಃ ದೈವೀ ಮೇಧಾ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಸಾಮಾ ಮೇಧಾ ಸುರಭಿರ್ಜುಷತಾಗಸ್ವಾಹ ಮೇಧಾಸುರಭಿರ್ವಿಶ್ವರೂಪಿರಣ್ಯವರ್ಣಾ ಜಗತಿ ಜಗಮ್ಯ ಊರ್ಜಸ್ವತಿ ಪಯಸಾಪಿನ್ಮಾ ಮೇಧಾ ಸುಪ್ರತೀಕಾಜುಷಂತ ಅಸತೋ ಮಾ ಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋ ಮಾ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋರ್ಮಾ ಅಮೃತಂಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು I now request revered Swami Suparnananda Ji Maharaj to felicitate the speakers on the dais and deliver his welcome speech. ಓಂ ಜನನಿ ಶಾರುದಾಂ ದೇವಿ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಜಗತ್ ಗುರು ಪಾದಪದ್ಮಿತೋ ಶ್ರೀ 
pranamami muhur muhur. I heartily welcome you all, the listeners of the dais, and also some of the speakers we have invited from different countries sitting among the listeners. I especially welcome in our midst Swami Sarvapriya Anandaji from Vedanta Society of New York, USA. I then invite, I then welcome Swami Medha Ji, Vedanta Society of Southern California, Hollywood, and also Professor Nirmalo Narayan Chakraborty, Rabindu Bharati University, Kolkata. There are two keynote addresses, one to be given by Nirmal Babu. Topic Spirituality as the Culmination of Philosophical Humanism, and keynote address two, Reality and Reality Plus, Advaita Vedanta and the Hard Problem of Consciousness. Sarva Priyananda. Vote of thanks by Swami Medha Nandaji. This is a small function, opening session, so to say inaugural session. I welcome them all, pay my love and regards to the Swamis present over here. I especially express my regards to Nirmal Narayan Chakraborty. Professor of Philosophy in Dubinda Bharati University. Now, Sami Medhanando, he has helped us a lot in organizing the seminar and he will speak out. The theme of the topic of the seminar, the re-emergence of spirituality in 21st century philosophy, consciousness, perception, reality, and value. But I feel also tempted to speak a few words because the subject is very much our own. It is dear to you all also because you have to live a life in the world. And you have to find out in what way you are related to this world around. Jeeva Jagato. I am an individual and behind me, around me, or even if you can say inside you also this universe, outer universe. I, in what capacity exist in this universe? That is the true philosophy. How do I look at it? We say that it is darsana. Darsana means to see, to view. What do you see? We see that the world is real and we are all playing here. Playing our part very joyfully. But ultimately what happens? We have to accept death. It is an inability. inability. That, is the, that is the ultimate and deep the goal of human life, to speak it superficially, to touch the death rope somehow. Some do it very pleasantly, some not that way. That is our, that is our philosophy, that is our subject to be known by each of us. So. And you have been listening to this, I say, stories, time and again, over and again, 
from the learned speakers all over the world and you have been very much fascinated by the speeches made by Swami Sarvapriyanandu. Why should I say you, I too? I cannot exclude myself from the plan. The way he chucked out. He's a very clever boy. <laughs> and so catchy, very catchy titles he chooses always. And we feel tempted. We know no way out, you see. And I have seen that every time the subjects are known, the top topics are known, uh, the way of, say, uh, <coughs> proceeding from the beginning to the end is very much, <coughs> say, comprehended, but it delivery is dealing with the subject, not dealing with the, say, listeners, is very, very unique. We are really caught by that. And I know it is not your craze that has brought you here. I won't say that you are all crazy people. Uh, you hear your hero, you want, you love to hear your hero's voice in front of you in person, not virtually. Right you are. I appreciate your zeal. As I told, this is a seminar on the re-emergence of spirituality. In the 21st century, philosophy, consciousness, perception, reality and value. All the items they have included very cleverly. It is a, say, brain, it is a brain of say, Medhananda maybe. He has put everything in the discussion, the philosophy, about which just I told you, this is the philosophy, Darsum, the finding out the relation between ourselves and the world. We are playing in and with. Consciousness, perception, reality, and value. Now, I can conclude in a single sentence in a single sense, by, com by taking into account all these five, one, two, three, four, uh, say five concepts. In what way? The relation among the concepts like consciousness, perception, reality, value is not complex at all. Rather, it follows that the spiritual aspirant being value strong first not skill strong, we are fond of. Value strong, those who are value strong, they are skill weak. And those who are skill strong, they are value weak. They go inversely. There is a negative relation between the two. Anyway, <clears throat> it follows that the spiritual aspirant being value strong would have to search for the real Real that, if that is real, which is not changing. That is not changing. If everything is changing. Then how can we see that this is fixed? The fan is <coughs> moving over it. How do you know that it is moving? Because you remain stationed. You are fixed. If you are also moving, as per the say, speed of the fan, then you won't see what, would, what is happening there. It would remain static. There is no change. So change, then there may be something which is fixed, which, is, which does not change over time. So the aspirant, being value strong, would have to search for the real. Real is that which is unchanged in space, time, and causation. Perceive it, the perception comes, in consciousness ever, in consciousness. Perceive it only in consciousness, which we do every day for five to six hours, for us only two or three hours, mind that, in sleep, deep sleep. Old people cannot sleep more than two or three hours. 
in the night. That is their problem. That is their problem. Otherwise, we need four to five or six hours a day to spend on sleep. And being in sleep, we are one with our consciousness. We are not conscious about our physical body, about our mind, about our intellect. We are just we are just oblivious of everything else. We do not know who we are. And you can know yourself as consciousness in, in deep sleep. Mind that. This is the goal. But when we get up, we forget everything. We engage ourselves in our day-to-day -day routine, this and that. The same old person we are. But as it is all known to us, when Jesus, when we go to sleep and come back, we are the same old person. Like goat, like cow, this, this all they are all sleeping. <coughs> After sleep, they look all alike, as before. Then, <coughs> the Jesus went into trance. And when he came back, he came back transfigured. That is, the, we have to know that state. That's why it is called avang manasa gocharam. It is beyond mind, body, and intellect. In in deep sleep, in in what we live, we live in consciousness. In dream, we live in mind and intellect. And in the waking state, Jagrat Avastha, we, uh, we live in physical body. And we separate our mind in dream. Mind that. That's why. There are so many philosophies to prove the same thing. But there is no doubt anywhere in the minds of the searching people for the reality. The goal is that, consciousness. But paths are different. Why? It is because of our mental tendencies. It is because of our eligibility, fitness. More than that, we love, some love bodies, some love Mind. Mind means cultural life. Some love the, 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 the uh, uh, life of civilization, life of enjoyment. But to be with mind is to be also in enjoyment, but this is finer enjoyment, like art, literature, music, this and that. We have to give food to your, to your say, subtle body, mental, mental food, necessary. So that way we move. So Dvaita Vad concerns with physical body. Vishishta Dvaita Vad concerns with mind. It is not that way. It is not that way very much physical. But still it is sustained by matter, matter, intelligent also matter. These are all non-conscious part of our being. That's why we have so many, so many philosophies, so many theories. That is it. But this connection is that, that we have to get to consciousness itself. And in Vedanto, we have assimilated all. That is the beauty of Vedanta. This Vedanta was criticized by Ramon Rai, Vidya Sagar even, as being life-negating and false philosophy. Uh, Arindam is present over here. He knows a lot about that. From the very beginning of Renaissance, Vedanta has been excluded. That's, that is the trouble, why it could not, it could not do that very ideal state, do justice to the ideal state 
a millennium because of their failure in recognizing Vedantic, Vedantic truth. Why Vedanta is so much appreciated right now, today? Because it is here. Vedanta is that religion where we can have what we want. It does not ever criticize enjoyment, physical enjoyment. You do this. Saho jagna praja sista puro vacho praja apati anena prasavish saddham esabo tu ishta kama dhuk. Beautiful. The Sakam sadhana. Sakam sadhana. Physical practices with, with desire. It is necessary. Unless we go through that state, we cannot think of the reality beyond this physical existence of ours. That is it. Whatever you want, you will get. Because whatever you get in the intermediate stage is nothing but the lower truths. You have to respect this. Respect this. The Vedanta with attributes, without attributes. Without attributes, popularized by Shankaracharya. With attributes, popularized by Ramanuja Acharya. But Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna <coughs> takes both Saguna and Nidguna aspect of Godhead. He accepted every path, every path. That is his beauty. It was not done before. It was left for him to take up. He did it. So this you are going to listen to. Not exactly the way I have been speaking to you, but in a different form. And at different depth, that is very, very important. I must at least read out the names of the distinguished guests who would be the speakers from tomorrow. I welcome you all to these, say, tomorrow and day after tomorrow's functions as you have done today. It, is it because of Sarvapyananda that you are here? Yes. This is, he is our pride. He is our glory. He is our glory. So it is a special manifestation of the divine. He is a special manifestation of divine. Mind that. Namaste. <clears throat> we may be saying the same thing, but what a see difference you will just discover. Now we have in our midst. This apart, Nirmaloda, Sarvapyanundu, Medhanundu, Ite Sauni of China, Najari, Najari, Marjina, Jubak from Poland, Geop Aston from US, San Francisco University. Kindly excuse me if I cannot <coughs> pronounce your names. <laughs> So it is jammed with consonants. And after two, three consonants, there is one vowel. I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> For example, Marjinna, M A R Z D N N A. Marjinna or Marjinna? Marjinna we know. It is not Marjinna. But Jubuk, I, do, I can't pronounce it. J A K U B. Jacob, then C Z A K. What to draw? Anyway, uh, sister, I beg to be pardoned. Geop Ashton, University of Francisco, U.S. Raquel Ferrande Formoso, University of Spain. Benedict 
Paul Gokke, Germany, Michael Barley, England, Jonathan Ganeri, University of Toronto, Canada. Uh, he is a very familiar face. Uh, sir, thousand kudos for your uh, coming this time also. He is our friend. Jayashankar Lalji is our regular visitor and he is one of our very own. Is he, is he there, Jayashankar Ji? Yes. Ah, Jayama. <coughs> he is not among the speakers right now. In this seminar, but next time he is here. Nilanjan Das of Canada. Oh, I thought that he would be from Bengal. <laughs> Bengal, you are from Bengal, but not from not for this purpose. <clears throat> you are invited not as a Bengali, as a professor of philosophy from University of Toronto. And Niti Singh is from she is from India, Banaras Hindu University. Tarini Asti, A W A S T H I, Asti. Flame University, India. I do not know what this flame means. F L A M E, Flame University. <coughs> Geoffrey Lee University of California, Berkeley, USA. Amit Chaturvedi, <laughs> he is also from Hong Kong, University of Hong Kong. And our Arindam Chakrut, Arindam Da, it is good that he has come back. He has come back. He is now, I thought, I am seeing something uh, like a ghost, that he is from Haryana. Harindamda, <laughs> where is he you now? Harindamda, where are you from? you are from Haryana, Sunipat, Ashoka University. Very nice. <clears throat> I think I have completed all the names. I took much of your time. Kindly excuse me. Namaste. Welcome to you all. Om Namah Shri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Surai Satchit Sukhaswarupaya Swamini Tapaharini Good evening everyone. I offer my respectful pranams to revered Swami Suparnanandaji Maharaj, revered Swami Sarvapiyanandaji Maharaj, revered Swami Tadvratanandaji Maharaj, and all the other senior Swamis in attendance. And my heartfelt namaskars to all of the philosophers from around the world who have taken the trouble to come here to Kolkata to participate in this very exciting three-day philosophy seminar. And my heartfelt namaskars to all of you here in attendance today. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you. More. It's a pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to this very exciting international philosophy seminar on the theme of the reemergence of spirituality in 21st century philosophy consciousness, perception, reality, value. I want to begin by mentioning that Professor Anand Vaidya of San Jose State University, who is a co organizer of the seminar, he can't be with, be with us tonight or for the duration of the seminar, unfortunately, due to a medical emergency, which required that he go back to the US. So that's very sad news, but let's all keep him in our prayers 
And there's one piece of good news that I wanted to convey right at the outset. Professor Anand Vaidya has been appointed a visiting professorship at UCLA starting this coming quarter. He will be the first professor of Indian epistemology and philosophy of mind at UCLA. This is a great achievement, so let's all give him a, a big round of applause. And let's all pray for Professor Vaidya's full and speedy recovery. We have a wonderful lineup of distinguished speakers in the coming days, starting today and going until the day after tomorrow. So it's a three-day seminar. As revered Swami Supanandaji has already mentioned, philosophers have come from no fewer than nine countries. This evening, we are blessed to have two wonderful keynote speakers. Professor Nilmallo Narayan Chakraborty, followed by Swami Sarvapriyanandaji. Tomorrow, Wednesday, January 3rd, and Thursday, the day after tomorrow, January 4th, there will be all-day academic sessions starting at 10 in the morning and going to around 5 p.m., about three panels per day. These sessions, these academic sessions, are registration only. So please keep that in mind. But at the very end of January 4th, after all the panels, we have a very special treat. We have a concluding keynote address by Professor Arindam Chakraborty, a very distinguished philosopher, who, as Maharaj just mentioned, has shifted recently to Ashoka University. Uh, his keynote address will be on Thursday, January 4th, from 4.30 p.m. The title of the keynote will be From Self-Analysis to Cosmic Love, Reconciling the Dry Tarka and Juicy Rasa, Faces of Spiritual Inwardness. And this keynote address at the end of the conference will also be open to the general public, just as today's keynotes are. So please do come to, to Professor Chakraborty's keynote on Thursday, January 4th at 4.30 p.m. Come early because seats will be taken pretty quickly. The overarching theme of this seminar is the spiritual turn in contemporary philosophy. I think it's striking to see that spiritual themes are cropping up in many different fields of philosophy, and that's what this whole seminar is about, and that's why we're all convened here today. Uh, I have very little time, and I want to give full time to the keynote speaker, so I'm going to be very brief about this and to give just a couple examples from four main areas of philosophy that are especially relevant to the seminar we're holding. First, philosophy of mind. The hard problem of consciousness is all the rage now. It's being widely discussed, and philosophers are starting to take very seriously theories like cosmopsychism, Micropsychism, idealism in many different varieties, many of them drawing explicitly on Indian spiritual traditions like Buddhism, Kashmiri Saivism, the, the thought of Sri Aurobindo, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Ramakrishna, and so on. Several talks in our seminar are going to focus on consciousness, uh, just to mention some of them. Swami Sarvapyanaji's keynote this evening. On January 4th, Amit Chaturvedi will be speaking on Buddhist panpsychism. And Jeffrey Lee will be speaking on consciousness in relation to materialism. Another field in which spiritual themes are cropping up is epistemology. We're finding a number of philosophers discussing and taking very seriously yogic perception, what's called yoga japratyaksha in Sanskrit and also starting to defend the epistemic value of mystical experience, really seriously taking mystical experience, spiritual experience, as a genuine source of knowledge. Many of our speakers will be discussing spiritual themes in epistemology. Tomorrow, there's going to be a panel, the opening panel, in fact, with Professor Ite Shani and Professor Martsena Yakupchak, both speaking on the epistemology of mystical experience. On January 4th, Tarini Avasti will be speaking on the epistemology of Diksha, spiritual initiation, in the Sri Vidya tradition. And 
Also on January 4th, Professor Janathan Ganiri will be speaking on Casey Bhattacharya on Absence, Attention, and Subjectivity. And last but not least, Professor Arindam Chakravarti will be delivering his concluding keynote address also on themes in epistemology, specifically spiritual inwardness. Another field, the third field I want to mention is philosophy of religion. Recently, philosophers are starting to take very seriously a new kind of argument for God's existence, which is called the argument from religious experience. This was, in the West at least, it was pioneered by C.D. Broad and then later by Richard Swinburne. And now many philosophers like Jerome Gelman and Kaimon Kwan are now discussing these arguments. Um, a number of speakers will be discussing spiritual themes in philosophy of religion. Uh, the first keynote today from Professor Nirmal Narayan Chakraborty will be discussing uh, very much this theme. I'll, I'll introduce him in a second. And tomorrow, Professor Benedict Paul Goeke will be discussing panentheism. Mikhail Burley, in the same panel, will be discussing Gita Govinda as philosophy of religion. And I'm on the same panel discussing religious pluralism in Sri Ramakrishna and S. Markheim. So there's a whole panel on philosophy of religion in relation to spirituality. And on January 4th, uh, Professor Nilanjan Das will be speaking on faith and the limits of rational inquiry in Sri Harsha. And Professor Niti Singh will be speaking on Sri Aurobindo's integral philosophy. And finally, I wanted to mention a fourth very exciting field at the intersection of philosophy and science. So I'm thinking of work in philosophy on things like artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and so on. We've got a panel tomorrow with two very distinguished speakers. The first is Professor Jeff Ashton, who will be speaking on biosemiotics in Sankhya philosophy, and Raquel Formoso, who will be speaking on yoga in relation to transhumanism. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Professor Nirmallo Narayan Chakraborty is former Vice Chancellor of Rubindro Bharati University in Kolkata, where he is presently Professor of Philosophy. His research areas include philosophy of language, classical Indian and Western analytic, epistemology, philosophy of religion, and environmental ethics. He is the former Member Secretary, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, some of his recent publications include articles like Self-Knowledge, The Moral Dimension. Realism, Anti-Realism, and Quietism, Has Philosophy Become Dispensable? On the Very Idea of the Authority of the Vedas, Tagore and the Idea of Emancipation, Methodology in Indian Philosophy, and A Cautionary Note on Motilal's Way of Doing Indian Philosophy, Provocative article title. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Nirmallo Narayan Chakraborty to the podium. Om Sthapakaya Cha Dharmasya Sarva Dharmasvarupine Avatara Varishthaya Ramakrishnayati Namaha Respected Swami Suparnanandaji, Revered Swami Sarva Priyanandaji, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, It is indeed a privilege for me to be able to join here on this occasion, this evening, let me convey my sincere thanks to Swami Medhanandaji for kindly inviting me on this occasion. Since uh, the focal theme of the seminar is the re-emergence of spirituality in 21st century philosophy, I would like to uh, speak on uh, the kind of spiritualism that one could find emerging out of a philosophy of man, so to say, advocated by classical Indian philosophers. 
Uh, in this speech, I shall not uh, focus on any particular philosophical system or any individual philosopher. Rather, I shall try to harp on the tenor of the classical Indian philosophical symphony, so to say. It is well known that the founding fathers of classical Indian philosophy steered their intellectual discourse around what they thought an ideal life should be like. This ideal life was not merely a matter of speculation. It was more of a practical necessity. The entire philosophical pursuit, in spite of its brilliant analysis and nuanced argumentative deliberation, carries the unmistakable mark of pragmatic constraint namely, attainment of a life that is worth living. In this background, naturally, the concept of man hovers over the philosophical landscape. As it is usually done, man in classical Indian philosophy is thought of as having two aspects, namely, the material or the natural aspect and the spiritual aspect. The natural side consists of elements, acts, and dispositions that belong to man's physical body, either originating directly from the body, through the mind, or from the external world. The spiritual side, on the other hand, consists of elements that do not have their origin in the physical body and the external world. These two aspects remain in close relation. Though the exact nature of this relation is a matter of intense dispute, one's, one could start the discourse by proposing that it is the unique I feeling, ahang bodha, that characterizes one's body and mind and whatever alternations happen there. Even in the unreflective stage, the presence of this I feeling could be assumed, even though not pronounced, and one could distinguish one's own bodily and mental changes from those of others. This I feeling also explains one's sense of possession of extra bodily things and her treatment of those things with a peculiar tenderness that is absent in her interaction with other things. Even if the I feeling is inalienably related to the physical mental complex, it is possible for the I, through progressive reflection, to dissociate itself from the entanglement of nature. And after this dissociation, what remains in the unreflective stage are the physical mental changes and the external world with no I hood or mindness, mamatwa, attached to it. Although normally the material and the spiritual side remain fused with each other, this fusion can be dissociated through progressive reflection where the physical mental complex undergoes subtler and subtler changes and only at the highest stage the split could be discovered in its entirety. Contrary to the materialist or naturalistic explanation of man, classical Indian philosophers emphasized some sort of direct realization or perception of whatever the account of man and his relation to the, worldly, to the world they offered. The majority of the classical Indian philosophers, barring a few exceptions, were not against the naturalistic method of explanation. In fact, at the level of manana, they did not have any alternative. At the post-manana stage, many of these philosophers talked about attempts to perceive the nature of man and his relation to the environing world directly. The exact nature of this direct awareness is amenable to different interpretations. For some, this post-manana stage is cognitive all through, it is a matter of 
progressive realization. Others think that it is a state of religious communion with the spirit that undergoes several states. One has to be careful in formulating the nature of the unity of spirit and matter that constitutes man. If this is simply a matter of togetherness, then it would imply that we are aware of these two elements in man in their exclusivity. It, however, is not possible to experience the two in their distinctness. We are not sure what there was in the name of the spirit whose departure has turned the body into a dead matter. Nor are we sure of what the matter is, even if to whatever extent it could be dissociated. Matter, once the spirit appropriates it, bears the mark of the spirit's conceptual repertoire. In this picture, spiritual realization is not a mystery. At the reflective stage, when one looks at pain, for example, from a distance, as it were, and consequently he tolerates it as he does not own it, even if the pain is his. At every stage in this progressive dissociation, the earlier lower stage that is transcended is retrospectively viewed as the stage where the spirit was not present the way it is present at the higher stage. At every stage, the two sides, though distinct, come to be related to each other. Thus, the spirit is always found in unison with matter till it is realized as dissociated from and thus transcending the unity at earlier stages. Since in these earlier stages, by remaining fused with the matter, the spirit appears to be quasi-material, there grows a demand for the spirit to be dissociated. This progressive dissociation of spirit is to be understood in its proper perspective. In a way, my body is an item of nature like many other items. And this body can be explained by the experts the same way other items of nature can be explained. But the same body is treated as unique and disparate when I treat it as my body and look at it with a delicate fondness. Although a part of nature, my living body seems to have an autonomy that the spirit possesses. And in this sense, my body is more spiritual than other items of nature. The larger implication of this is that, except in the final stage, where the dissociation is final, and the spirit exists in its self-containedness, during all the earlier stages of dissociation, the spirit carries the matter with it, though at every stage the matter gets thinner and thinner. Thus, when the physical body gets more spiritual, the other items of nature gets transformed. As the spirit undergoes gradual dissociation, the body, along with its changes, could be looked at as nearer the spirit proper. Insofar as perception, memory, thought, etc., are not dissociated from the corresponding objects, the relevant situation or experience may be described as quote unquote object perceived, quote unquote object remembered, etc. But once these objects are experienced in dissociation, the same situation may be described as quote unquote perceiving the object quote unquote, remembering the object, implying that these objects lack autonomy, which is the hallmark of the spirit. It is true that even this last vestige of naturality will be removed with the growing demand of the spirit to realize itself in its complete majestic self-containedness. Thus all mental acts as associated with the objects of nature are themselves the items of nature. It is only in introspection that their knownness is revealed and so distance itself from nature. There is a further demand 
where these mental acts mature into recognition of themselves as items of spirituality. It is undeniable that knowledge refers to an item in nature in the sense that the natural item acts as a causal determinant. But the act of referring is knowledge's own function, implying that the knowledge might not also refer at least the way it wants. This is evident in an illusory experience where knowledge refers to another item or in hallucination where knowledge creates its object which is not a causal determinant of that very knowledge. Similar is the case in constructive imagination and thinking, where knowledge is not determined by nature, rather it moves by itself. Introspective awareness, though necessarily dependent on first level mental acts, is not causally determined by nature. Introspection in this sense could be called over natural. More importantly, though introspection refers to the first level mental experience, it does so freely. Introspection is not obligated to refer to it. The nature of the reference that introspection bears to the first level mental experience is pseudo reference, for there is no necessity for, in, for introspection to refer at all. This is when introspection is realized as a completely dissociate spirit. One could also talk about the dissociation of the spirit in so far as the volitional aspect of human behavior is concerned. However, the dissociation of the volitional spirit would take a different direction from that of the cognitive spirit. In cognitive dissociation, the spirit gradually withdraws itself from the naturalistic bondage. This is not true of volition, for volition by its nature is directed to nature. Volition, generally speaking, consists in making some attempt to bring change in nature following a rule and with a definite purpose. In this circumstance, the volitional dissociation, in order to realize the spirit in it, consists in gradual withdrawal from all kinds of naturalistic treatment of both the body and the extra bodily nature serving my naturalistic interests. One step removed, man distinguishes himself from animals by transcending his bare biological interests. Even if, even if at this stage human behavior is conscious, if not self-conscious, and human reactions are fully determined by the natural forces of attachment and aversion. This self-consciousness further demands to move beyond the shackles of natural determinations towards the realization of the spirit proper. This dissociation of the spirit manifests itself in disinterested action, action but without detachment. Positively describing, Volitional dissociation consists in the attempt to rearrange the nature not being determined by one's naturalistic motive and more importantly considering the other, you for example, as a being as worthy of consideration as I am and not manipulating the other to serve my naturalistic interest. Thus all possible use the others mingle with I and there is a great leveling. Volitional dissociation in its spiritual cascade breaks the barrier between I and thou, making room for I am thou. Needless to say, spiritual activities in their volitional dissociation could be directed to me as I, but then this I is one instance of the possible use the others. In this perspective, persons become transnatural. If one tries to look at the set of persons from this transnatural perspective as a unitary whole, one might want to call it God or whatever other name one, one wants to use. And in this sense, spiritual volition makes room for religion. Whereas for cognitive realization, the transnatural spirit 
steps involving introspection and beyond are to be taken recourse to, to spiritual volitional realization makes this realization real in the sense of constructing a unitary person by discovering its autonomous spiritual nature. It is true that social morality and social religion are formulated in definite socio-political and cultural contexts. And as a consequence, people react to these codes that are found in tradition or scriptures. But the distant and the final authority lays with the spiritual volition. One could similarly talk about progressive dissociation of the spirit regarding feeling and emotion. There are philosophers who have worked out in detail the more and more subtle forms the emotive life of man might take while undergoing the progressive dissociation of the spirit. Others have tried to interpret the dissociation of spirit directed toward feeling and emotion as an alternative to the cognitive realization of the dissociation of the spirit by offering an alternative aesthetic language loaded with emotive nuances. If the picture that has been sketched in the earlier paragraphs concerning the nature of man as expressed in classical Indian philosophy is a tenable one, then it suggests that the essence of the spirit in man lies in its progressive dissociation from the natural in man. But this dissociation is not at the cost of the value that the natural in man contributes. In normal talk of dissociation, separation takes place ignoring one of the parties in the divorce. Some kind of disparity is the mark of dissociation that we talk about in common parlance. This could be called exclusive dissociation. The classical Indian philosophers, while talking about dissociation, are more inclined to talk about what, what could be called inclusive dissociation. Perhaps barring some of the metaphysicians having a strong leaning towards a monistic worldview, a large number of philosophers of classical India took great interest in the naturalistic methodology while overcoming the natural. When they talk about dissociation of the spirit, this is an inclusive dissociation in the sense that in different stages of progressive dissociation, the natural gets thinner and thinner, and as a result, the natural gets transformed. This explains why, insofar as the Indian conception of man is concerned, socio-material development has never been ignored. The worldly life is of extreme importance, for it sustains life. Abhidaya is as important as Nishreyasa. In fact, all the prescriptions and prohibitions are aimed at developing a society of fulfilled individuals. What is important in the Indian context is that freedom that an individual exercises is aimed at maintaining the stability and balance of society. The naturalistic view, as mentioned earlier, starts from the alienated man and gives an account of how that alienated man, through the exercise of his freedom, can reappropriate himself in a society that is exploitative of him. Indian view, classical Indian view at least, on the other hand, looks upon man as an individual constantly trying to identify himself with society, aiming at maintaining stability and balance in society. On the naturalistic view, social change is a historical necessity, where the individual breaks his alienation and gets the opportunity to express his full potential, sometimes giving rise to a social revolution. According to the identification theory, on the other hand, there is an inherent tendency in the society to maintain its balance and stability in spite of occasional chaos. Society cannot be in a state of perpetual revolution. The stability of a society can be torn apart at times, either by foreign aggression or by internal fissures and maladjustments, 
But society tries to get back to its usual course of stability and balance since then, in spite of initial hiccups. So many divergent and conflicting philosophical views developed on Indian soil, but on the whole, all of them remained in peaceful coexistence, giving rise to the wonderful mosaic of classical Indian philosophical systems. There is a metaphysical grounding of this identification theory, so-called. Although man is always infused with empirical elements, in reflection, the spiritual in man can be delineated and can be talked about. In this sense, one can talk about, quote-unquote, subject proper, the spirit in man that is abstracted from its empirical surroundings. This subject proper is conceivable as autonomous and is the source of all the basic moral and spiritual values. But all these values are understood in terms of the reference to empirical life. In this sense, the source of the values is the subject proper, but although they always carry a reference to the empirical. Because of this constant reference to the empirical, the subject proper often loses its autonomy and identifies itself with nature. And this subject proper can be realized through a mental exercise. Even the common talk about detachment hints at gradual withdrawal, not in the sense of inaction, but in the sense of being unmoved by the results of action. With this progressive detachment, one comes to experience more and more what is essential to him. So if the idea of subject proper is a metaphysical backup of the Indian view of identification, then such a metaphysics can have practical application through a certain course of training. Even in our everyday life, we exemplify this training. For example, when we calmly confront the death of a near and dear one, material losses, insult, etc. The more we develop this attitude, the more we come closer to pure subjectivity, which is the essence of man. The Indian naturalists went to the extreme of advocating, realizing the nature in man as the summum bonum, calling the real realization of the subject proper as a romantic delusion. They developed a detailed method of epistemology and morals. Although these Indian naturalists could never succeed in securing a firm ground in the Indian psyche, they nevertheless were taken seriously and anti-naturalists took great pain in refuting the naturalist views. The Indian naturalists paved the way to the rise of reformist ideas in Buddhism and Jainism. But the question is, what is it about the idea of freedom that makes it so valuable to mankind? Freedom, if it is to be an ideal that is worth pursuing, then it must have a trans transforming effect on man. Freedom is generally understood as having free will or exercising free choice. But one could ask whether this free choice can be accounted for by natural causes. If it is a matter of choice between two alternative natural tendencies, then choosing one of these falls short of free choice in a significant sense. If between satisfying hunger and the will to leave, I have to choose one, this choice is made under compulsion. If in the ultimate analysis, all our actions are driven by natural tendencies, then freedom in the sense of free choice does not seem to have any place left for it. Of course, in both the alternative choices, there is the phenomenological feeling of I choose. It is true that the I sense accompanies either case. This I sense might not be pronounced in the unreflective state, but its presence even there is indubitable. For at that very primary stage, I can distinguish my action from another's action, my body from another's body, and so on. Thus, I choose, this expression can be rephrased as, I do, 
And this action is something that I call mine. So looking at this way, choice is an action with which the sense of mindness, mamatwa, is associated. The mere presence of mindness does not guarantee the presence of free choice. For mindness, in a thin sense, might be present in an action that is in a way forced on me. Mindness, in this sense, does not guarantee agency, where the presence of having intention is a must. Even when you jiggle my hand and I spill the tea, although I am not the agent, the spilling act has been performed by me, and there is a mindness present here. Thus, if every choice is an act, and if every act presupposes a choice, then a vicious infinite regrets would arise. If, on the other hand, the choice is not an act, it can neither be treated as cognition nor a failing or emotion. The choice could be preceded by cognition. If the choice is a desire or wish, then the desire for the future happening is, not, is nothing but acting on an idea and desire to do something now is simply acting in, acting in making. Thus, the reply to the question whether there can be actions that can be called mine, and yet regarding which I do not have any choice, is that while an act can be called mine in a minimal sense, my bodily behavior for example, yet this act befalls on me over which I don't have any choice. Here, there is no choice that precedes the act. Notice that this absence of preceding choice is different from the similar absence that determinists talk about. In determination, there is a feeling, sorry, in determinism, there is a feeling that I have done the action and that this is, in an important way, my choice. Mindness, or the I feeling, does not necessarily imply choice. And if choice is the mark of freedom, then mindness by itself does not imply freedom. In a larger context, freedom can be viewed as a choice either to submit or not to the given. And this given could either be empirical circumstances in which the person happens to be placed or the tendencies originating within. We sometimes do not succumb to the empirical pressure even though it might be a very strong one. The I feeling manifests in this choice of not submitting is a full-blooded one. The agency raises its head in full glory in the exercise of this choice. This aspect of freedom where man executes his ability not to be limited by the given alternatives is what constitutes freedom as transcendence. Man is thrown, so to say, in this world of contingences and himself becomes part of the natural world. But man's freedom allows him not to surrender to nature. Man refuses to yield to nature because after all, some of the empirical givens stand in the way to realizing the intimate nature of man. And this is the essence of all the moral and spiritual lessons. Morals, in its details, is an attempt to organize natural givens in such a manner so that man can exercise his freedom in not resigning himself to the given. Man has this onus on him in not giving in to nature. Morality then consists in exercising this freedom and failure to do this leads one to not being moral. A man might falter in not succumbing to the given but the journey of man's civilization is the story of man's unwavering attempt to exercise his ability not to resign to nature. Reorganization of the empirical given is also an attempt on man's part to fulfill his inner call. The more man exercises this ability, the more moral he becomes and the closer he gets to his inner core. In so far as man tries to transcend the given, he exercises his freedom in its negative sense. Insofar as man re reorganizes the given and positively constructs something out of it, he can be said to exercise his positive freedom. 
this freedom can manifest itself in the cognitive, affective, and volitional life of man. In the sensuous awareness of the given, along with its associates, when man analyzes, judges, and constructs theories of the given, he is already in the realm of cognitive freedom. Our emotional freedom consists in expressing our sentiments in works of art and religion that have their own dynamics. Volitional freedom is exercised when man is not driven by desire directed to empirical given. I would like to argue that freedom gets its value not from complying with the given, even if freely. It is the indomitable spirit in man to move beyond the given that gives freedom its worth. Freedom in its both negative and positive aspects is not a passive state of compliance. Had it been so, man's progress in individual and social fields through the exercise of freedom would not have made any sense. In the case of free compliance with the given, what is present is only the formal acceptance of freedom, the subjective feeling of free choice. A man starts his journey as an animal and gradually grows his distinctive essence through his encounter with the surrounding world. And this repertoire of experience of the form matter complex gives freedom its content. Thus, the form of freedom is always a later discovery. I started my discussion with the idea of free will in the sense of freely choosing one over another. This is what I would like to call freedom two. The hierarchical theory of free will was introduced to account for the nature of free will. This raises some problems which leads some philosophers to take up the idea of agency. If having a description of the act, including the idiom of intention, is the mark of agency, then an analysis of the I feeling accompanying the intentional choice is required. This is where one could introduce the idea of freedom from the given. Freedom as transcendence. This freedom from has its echo in the classical Indian concept of detachment, vairagya, and the positive course of action to realize this ideal is called practice or avyasa. All the actions accompanied by I feeling are in an important sense initiated by inclination, raga, or aversion, dvesha. The first stage of freedom in actions accompanying I feeling consists in feeling in internal perception in the language of Indian philosophy that the action or the wheel concern has occurred in the subject herself. The next level consists of action through detachment, vairagya, which consists of free refusal to submit to the given determinants. Philosophers in classical Indian tradition have referred to different facilitators in bringing out this, de this detachment, namely cognition, volition, or emotion. Some hold that once this detachment is brought out, it gets an autonomous status in man, and so it acquires a relatively independent status, not requiring constant backup from the facilitators. If detachment is the negative aspect of freedom, then the manifestation of the pure, intimate nature of man becomes the summum bonum of human life. Since this idea of transnatural has been highlighted as the essence of man, the worth of man lies in recognizing this autonomy of the spiritual. Recognition of worth implies change in an attitude that brings with it a particular kind of behavior. It is of course true that an, that an attitude sometimes might fail to translate itself into behavior, but this is the failure of the agent and not of the object of attitude. If we consider the attitude of respect, then respect might show itself just in the mental disposition that the agent entertains, or it might manifest itself in action, even sometimes in inaction. But there are certain cases of respect where respect itself is constituted by behaving in a particular manner, like respecting the rules of traffic, for example. 
Although varieties of things could be objects of respect, it is important to notice that the agent of the attitude of respect must be a self-conscious rational being capable of appreciating the worth of the object of respect and may be held responsible for failing to show respect. The agent of the attitude of respect thinks that there are some respect warranting features in the object in virtue of which the object demands respect. The agent may be wrong in thinking that the object possesses these respect warranting features or that the agent may be wrong in taking these features to be respect warranting and in that case the respect that the agent shows may be inappropriate. In this way respect is different from a gut feeling, desire, etc. Against the above mentioned logic of the attitude of respect, one could accommodate this attitude in the classical Indian pursuit. I would like to distinguish respect to from respect for. Respect for is an attitude that one entertains after finding out some features in the object and these features are positively appraised in the society in general. We can respect one for being an excellent teacher or a skillful carpenter. Respect for could be a fractured attitude in the sense that we can respect somebody for being an excellent teacher and we may not respect him as an efficient administrator. Respect too is more closely related to the object per se, to the very nature of the object as such. This involves recognition of the true nature of the object, irrespective of whether one can find out the presence of the positively appraised respect warranting features in the object or not. Respect too, on the other hand, does not make any such demand. It must, however, be noted that respect too could be nourished or emboldened by the increase of respect for. This is what uh, might be said to happen in classical Indian philosophy of man. Setting the emancipatory goal fixed, Indian philosophy has always shown respect to people who have engaged themselves in following the prescribed path to the attainment of the summum bonum of human life. Dissociation from the natural and resultant realization of the spiritual in man has always found a favorable place in philosophical activities in India. Respect too here demands that the object of respect makes sincere attempts to, real, to realize the essential in him. This does not mean to be indifferent to the people who have gained skills in virtue of which we can have respect for them. In fact, many stories and parables in ancient literature are abound with characters who can, in the sense explained here, demand both respect to and respect for. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Professor Nirmalo Narayan Chakraborty for that very thought-provoking and subtle talk on spiritualism and the interplay of nature and spirit in classical Indian philosophical traditions. I think we first met in Shimla a few years ago at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study at an ethics conference, and he gave a wonderful talk. I think it was unanimous that people agreed that his talk was the best out of all of ours, and now I hope you can see why. And it is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce our second keynote speaker, Swami Sarvapriyanandaji. I was fortunate enough to have had him as my Acharya in training center in Belamut for two years, and more than that, he's been a dear mentor and friend to me for many more years than that, extending back to even before I joined the order in 2010. Revered Swami Sarvapyanji Maharaj does not need any introduction, but I'll give a very brief one anyway. 
Swami Sarvapriyananda Ji has been the minister and spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society of New York since January 2017. He joined the Ramakrishna Mutt in 1994 and received sannyasa in 2004. He served as an Acharya teacher of the Monastic Probationers Training Center at Bilurmat, India. He also served in various capacities in different educational institutes of the Ramakrishna Mission in India and as the Assistant Minister of the Vedanta Society of Southern California in Hollywood, where I'm currently at. During 2019 to 2020, he was a Nagral Fellow at the Harvard Divinity School. Swami Sarvapiananda is a well-known speaker on Vedanta, and his talks are extremely popular globally via the internet, especially YouTube. He has been a speaker on various prestigious forums, such as TEDx, SAND, Google Talks, etc. He has also been invited to speak at several universities across the world, including Harvard University. The Swami has engaged in dialogue with many eminent thinkers, such as Deepak Chopra, Rupert Spira, Rick Archer, David Chalmers, and Sam Harris. He has played a prominent role in organizing and participating in various interfaith panels and seminars, including speaking at the World Parliament of Religions in Toronto in 2018 and at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Some of Swami Savrapiyanandaji's popular talks have been compiled into e-books entitled, Who Am I? What is Vedanta? and Dissolve into Infinity, which are all available on Amazon Kindle. Revered Swami Sarvapyananji will now deliver his keynote address on Reality and Reality Plus, Advaita Vedanta and the Hard Problem of Consciousness. Please join me in welcoming Swami Sarvapyananji to the podium. Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya, Om Shanti 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 Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace. Rivet Swami Supernananda Ji Maharaj, dear Swami Medhananda Ji, respected Professor Chakraborty, very eminent philosophers gathered here from across the world, revered monks, uh, dear friends. It's wonderful to be here. It's one of my favorite places, the Institute of uh, Culture, especially the library here. Whenever I get an opportunity, I uh, you know, I rush to the stacks there and spend time, most time, time browsing rather than reading. Now, I'm right now in New York, in the Vedanta Society of New York, the first uh, Vedanta Society, in fact, the first ashram started in the West, started by Swami Vivekananda in 1894. New York also boasts wonderful uh, educational institutions, New York University is there, Columbia University is there. New York University has a wonderful department of philosophy, of Western analytic philosophy, especially philosophy of mind. And I realized this about five or six years ago when I just went to attend a seminar there and I saw these uh, philosophers, when they were introduced, I realized th those who were sitting next to each other I had actually seen their books up there in the stack next to each other, you know. So <laughs> there they were stacked next to each other uh, on, on the podium there. Among them, one of the most well-known across the world, outside, uh, even outside philosophy circles, is David Chalmers. And he is known especially for one thing. Uh, that is the term, the phrase, the hard problem of consciousness. 
the hard problem of consciousness. So this is a, this is a term you might keep hearing again and again throughout this uh, seminar over the next few days. And this is where I would like to enter into the subject, why spirituality is re-emerging in philosophy at this juncture. Consciousness is central. Consciousness is central. Um, re recently, Oxford University Press, a few years ago, they published five great unsolved questions in philosophy. Bit of an oxymoron, I think most questions in philosophy tend to remain unsolved. That's what is bread and butter for many of our other colleagues here. <laughs> but, uh, but what struck me was the very nature of these questions. What are the most important questions in philosophy according to Oxford University Press? Listen to the questions. Is there free will? One. Second question was, can we know anything at all? A question about skepticism, knowledge. Third question was, who am I? What is the self? The fourth question in that list was, what is death? Death not in the physical uh, sense, physiological sense, but in the sense of the death of the self. And then there was one more question, uh, can there be global justice? But what struck me was, out of these five questions, the first four questions were directly related to consciousness. Just think about it. Free will, knowledge, self, death. Even global justice in a sort of, sort of distant um, cousin of this subject of consciousness. So consciousness is so central to philosophy. It struck me rather late in the day that, you know, in philosophy, so the, the professional philosophers here will have to bear with me. I can almost feel them rolling their eyes. <laughs> but, uh, but for the rest of us, in philosophy, the three broad areas of philosophy are, you know, what is real? Is the world real? Is God real? Is Brahman real? Am I real? What is real? So that's one, one branch of philosophy. And we call it metaphysics. A fancy new name is ontology, which comes from being. What is real? The second question you ask in philosophy, the second big branch of philosophy, is how do you know anything? If you say God is real, if you say Brahman is real, the world is false, the question should be, how do you know? How do you know this? So the question of knowledge, and naturally it comes. Whenever we make any claim about the world, the self, about God, question of how do you know? So that's called epistemology, that's the second big branch of philosophy. And then there is one more branch of philosophy, what used to be under different heads, you know, uh, aesthetics and morals and uh, all these things, uh, the values, they've all been clubbed together broadly under a term, now it's called axiology. So three, three big questions in philosophy. What is real? How do you know anything? And what's the point of it? What's the meaning of it? What's the purpose of it? What should we do? So these three big questions. And it struck me rather late in the day, from the Advaita Vedanta perspective at least, there is one answer to all of these questions. What is real? Brahman. Existence itself. How do you know anything? Brahman as consciousness, Chaitanya. What is the point of it all? What is the meaning, purpose, value in life? Ananda. Brahman as Ananda, bliss itself. So Advaita Vedanta gives this one answer to all these central questions or branches of philosophy. And you can see Brahman as pure consciousness is central to all of this. Even the theme of the, of the seminar we have got today, if you look at it, consciousness, perception, value, uh, reality, all of these sort of revolve around this consciousness. So consciousness is very, very central. And it has become more central recently, in the last couple of decades, 20, 30 years, for a number of reasons. Suddenly there is an upsurge of interest in consciousness studies. Um, I remember I attended, a, um, I think Professor Chakravarti was also there, uh, uh, Arindam Chakravarti, a debate, David Chalmers and Christoph Koch, I think that was in Brooklyn a few years ago. And we went just to listen to the debate on, on the nature of consciousness. I think it ended with 
David Chalmers pretending to pour water on the head of Christoph Koch. A very contentious, friendly actually, not that contentious. But Christoph Koch said, he's a, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. He was the chief scientist of the Paul Allen Brain Institute at that time. Um, he said, when he went into this area of consciousness in neuroscience, all his colleagues and his superiors, his guides, professors, they told him, it's a career killer. You're going to destroy your career. And this is, this is the worst possible area you can enter. But now you see, it's the hottest area of study. One reason, of course, is the new imaging technology. There are these fMRI scans, new kind of scanning technology which scans the brain with, and we get fine detail. So you know much more about the activity going on in the brain. So the interest in consciousness, studying consciousness through that. But also, um, another area is, of course, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, you know, tremendous development in information sciences. So that has led to an interest in consciousness. But also, it is uh, in the philosophy of mind. There is an upsurge of interest in consciousness studies. And David Chalmers is a person who single-handedly, I think, is at least, if not completely, greatly responsible for this new upsurge of talk and debate uh, ab uh, about consciousness. So, consciousness studies. The hard problem of consciousness. What is this hard problem of consciousness? Um, short, like a 101, a quick introduction to that. But it's important for us to understand. We are all conscious. We are all aware. We all are, we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. All of us are thinking right now. We're thinking, we're feeling. We understand, we remember, we desire, we hate. Uh, we wake and we dream and we sleep. Often in philosophy lectures like this, you know, all three states are present, waking, dreaming, and sleep. So veritable Mandukya Upanishad is going on here. Uh, all of this is going on at the same time. I mean, uh, we are the series of experiences, what David Chalmers calls like an internal movie playing out inside us. But how is it happening? Why is this happening? How do you explain it? The, the paradigm here, yes, the, the, uh, the, the mainstream paradigm here is because, you know, in, in our world, uh, everything is, uh, is matter, energy, time, space, the materialist paradigm. That's what we have been taught in school, and that's what scientists believe, that everything, reality here is uh, matter, energy, time, space, and uh, so everything has to be explained in terms of matter. So if we are conscious, if we are aware, uh, somehow it has to be explained in terms of matter that the brain and the nervous system are producing consciousness. This was taken as a given. Nobody really doubted it. I mean, it was not really an area of interest, though nobody really understood it also. So it's only recently this, this interest has become very sharp and focused. How does the brain, if at all the brain does produce consciousness, how does it do so? The point which David Chalmers makes, and he is not the first to make it, this is a problem well known in the history of philosophy, but in our time he has focused attention on it by coining this term, the, the phrase, the hard problem of, of consciousness. What is this hard problem? Why is it a problem? And why is it hard? So it goes like this. Um, if we scan the brain as is being done now, uh, with finer and greater and greater sophistication, the last thing that you will find is minute electrical activity going on in the living tissue of the brain. In, our, in the uh, neurons in the brain, there's fine electrical activity going on. And the idea is that somehow that activity in the brain is producing consciousness. All our seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, desiring, hating, uh, all our science and religion and spirituality, everything is being produced by the, that tiny electrical activity in the brain. Uh, that's the, that was the, that's the idea. And there's a reason for that. The reason is this. There is what is called a tight correlation. Um, when we report something, it hurts. Uh, there's a pain. 
And the neuroscientist will scan the brain and say that, look, there is this burst of electrical activity going on in a distinct region of the brain, and that always lights up when you say, this hurts. And therefore, that must be somehow connected to your feeling of hurt. And so that's producing it. But that's not an explanation. Correlation is not causation. Uh, there is a serious, what um, philosophers call an explanatory gap. Uh, there's a gap in explanation. What do I mean by this gap in explanation? It's like this. A full and thorough explanation would be like, um, Say when a car is being produced in a factory, in an assembly line, a car is being produced. So on one end you see the material, raw material go in, the parts go in, and on the other end you see a car come out. But the, every step in the production of the car, you can, be, you can see it. You can go to the factory and take a look at the assembly line. You can see how the whole thing is coming together at every step, and you can see the output, the car. But you cannot do that you cannot do that with consciousness. You can observe the brain for all you want. You can observe the neurochemical activities in the brain for all you want. You can observe the fine electrical activity in the neurons, but from there to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, imagining, understanding, philosophizing. Where is this, you know, how is it coming up? How can a little burst of electricity be this vivid experience that we are all having? Color, sound, shape, sensation. How? It's not enough to say that is it. That burst of electricity is uh, consciousness. It is not. When you are seeing, you're seeing me, you're seeing this place, you're thinking about it. You're not feeling little jolts of electricity. Even if you felt it, that feeling also would have to be explained. So this is the explanatory gap. Recently I had the privilege, thanks a great deal to Professor Chakravarti, of being sent back to school again. You heard, the Harvard Divinity School. I didn't spend much time at the Harvard Divinity School, but I spent a lot of time at the philosophy department in Emerson Hall. And I took a course in the philosophy of mind. So a survey uh, of, an I was surprised and happy to see even the textbook taught at Harvard for the philosophy of mind is edited by David Chalmers. So a survey of the entire um, you know, gamut of thought in the philosophy of mind and the sensation and, and the feeling I got, and I wrote this a little provocative, is that I felt the last person who said something important in the philosophy of mind was Descartes 300 years ago. <laughs> There is famous cogito orgosum and so on, and the mind-body dualism which came from there. And after that, especially in the last 50 to 100 years, if you look at all the papers, all the publications, broadly speaking, they fall into two categories. One category, trying to reduce mind and consciousness into body, into brain. So what is mind, what is consciousness? It is brain or nervous activity. Or some papers will try to show that at one time it was a style in uh, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, this language philosophy, that all talk of mind and consciousness is just that. It's an illusion generated by talk. Uh, or some, like Skinner and all, would dismiss mind and consciousness altogether and try to say that it's all behavior. Whatever it is, reduction. What is consciousness? Nothing but brain. What is consciousness? Nothing but language. What is consciousness? Nothing but behavior. Who was it who said it's nothing buttery? <laughs> Professor Chak Chakravarti used the term. Nothing buttery, a kind of nothing buttery. Um, and the other group of papers all saying, sorry guys, it doesn't work. For these, these, these reasons, you are unable to reduce consciousness and mind to the brain. Um, Many, uh, it's, it's sort of, those who study philosophy, they all go through these papers, uh, to, to these readings. So, consciousness, trying to explain it in terms of brain, that's one attempt in the philosophy of mind, and the other, other is to say that these attempts are not succeeding. And Thomas Nagel's, what is it like to be a bat, or Mary seeing red for the first time, and so many such examples. Those who study philosophy, they know of this. So that was my, my feeling, that the subject is stuck. The subject is stuck. Philosophy of mind is a subject which has stalled. Now we have the possibility 
of reviving that subject uh, through this new gate, the gateway of the hard problem of consciousness. So it is forcing us to rethink. Can consciousness be reduced to brain? Probably not. Now, I am saying this, many philosophers like David Chalmers and others are saying it, some people have spoken to, they are saying this, I'm sure many of the philosophers gathered here are of like mind, but there are many others, very eminent philosophers, who, are, who don't agree with this, we must acknowledge that. So, um, they will say that, no, actually, you know, um, consciousness is actually generated by the brain. I met a philosopher, uh, Massimo, he's in the City University of New York. So he said, I am convinced, Swami, that, the, uh, con that consciousness is generated by the living brain. Um, how? Hard problem of consciousness, how? He said, we don't know, but give us 50 years, we will explain it. Now, this is a serious position. This is called promissory materialism. Uh, now, he, uh, he backed it up with an argument. I just, I'm giving you this as an example. This is a whole spectrum of uh, uh, arguments. An example. So he said, look, Life, 100 years back, uh, we thought life is a divine mystery which can, we can never explain through science. But today, and, uh, Massimo is uh, not only a philosopher, he's a biologist. So he said, today we can explain the processes we call life down to the molecular level. And that for me is a good enough explanation. So what you thought could not be explained 100 years back has now been explained at great depth and detail. Uh, and exactly the same thing will happen to consciousness. We will be able to explain consciousness uh, in 30, 40, 50, 100 years. Now I said, I immediately gave a Vedantic response to it, which is, in principle this is wrong. In principle this is a category mistake. Why? Uh, this is the heart of the heart problem. It's not that it's, you give us more time, more technology, more grants, uh, and more research uh, students and grad students and we will solve the problem. No, it won't happen. It won't happen. It's a problem in principle. So he asked, why is it a problem in principle? It's because it's like this from a Vedantic perspective. See, you can, def there's a very elegant way of defining consciousness. See, even the definition of consciousness, it's, it's vague, it's difficult to define consciousness. In the field of consciousness studies, it's ambiguous. There are multiple definitions. There are many operational definitions. A friend of mine, a monk, he, he told me once, this whole consciousness studies is an immature field. I said, why is it an immature field? Where you cannot, he said, you cannot define the object of your study. So <laughs> it's not yet a mature field. But in Vedanta, you have a way of defining consciousness. One way is anidam chaitanyam. Consciousness is not this. Whatever you can classify as this in our experience, this, that's not consciousness, that's an object. This table, an object. This uh, shirt, an object. This body, because you can classify it as, a, as this, it's an object. This um, thought, this thought, therefore it's an object, it's not consciousness. That to which this thought and this body and this shirt and this table are appearing, that is consciousness. So it's a very phenomenological way of pointing out what is consciousness to, to the subject. Now, I said to the gentleman, when you say life has been explained in terms of molecular processes down to the molecular processes, Vedanta has no objection to that. You have explained a complex objective phenomena in terms of more fundamental objective phenomena. But the moment you say, I will explain consciousness in terms of objective brain activity, objective phenomena, you are making a category mistake. You are jumping from something that's not an object uh, into the objective world. And so in principle, you can't do that. Of course, that already presupposes a Vedantic uh, paradigm. Was he impressed? Not the least. <laughs> I don't think it made any, any mark on him this, uh, him this uh, argument. But what did make a mark was, it's very interesting, that this was actually a bet 25 years ago, 25 years ago. These two gentlemen, David Chalmers and Christoph Koch, had a bet. And uh, um, the bet was, Christoph Koch said, the way brain science is, pro is proceeding these days. Within 25 years, we'll be able to explain consciousness in terms of brain activity. 
We will reduce consciousness. We will give a materialistic basis of consciousness. And David Chalmers says you cannot because it's a mistake in principle to, to think that. 25 years ago, and it, everybody, especially the two, two people who, who made the bet, they would forgotten about the bet. Just last two months ago, somebody reminded them 25 years have passed. So who has won the bet? Have you been able to explain consciousness in terms of brain or not? And Christoph Koch, to his credit, was the first to admit, absolutely not. We have made no progress in explaining consciousness in terms of brain activity. We have learned a lot about the brain. Neuroscience has advanced uh, a lot in the last two and a half decades. But progress towards explaining how that brain activity produces subjective experience, not at all. Not at all. And I think the terms where he had to give a case of champagne or something to, uh, so, so finally he handed over that case uh, of uh, champagne to David Chalmers and he said, uh, Christoph Koch said, give us 25 years more. <laughs> but he, he also said he, half humorously, that's all I, I, I think I won't live more than 25 years, so I'll extend it to next 25 years. So this is the problem. You um, cannot explain brain activity in terms of consciousness. Let me approach it from another angle uh, before proceeding. AI, artificial intelligence. Now, there are these remarkable devices, these computer programs. Um, you have, all of you have heard of chat GPT and all of that. So this artificial intelligence, it can do amazing things. I asked chat GPT, write me a poem on Swami Vivekananda, and it did so. Not poet laureate material, but good enough, good enough. I mean, I don't think a schoolboy would come up with a better poem than that. But what it did next, no poet, the greatest poets on the world cannot do it. Next, I said, write another poem on Vivekananda. It immediately produced another poem. And if you keep on throughout the day asking Chad GPT to write new poems and newer poems on Vivekananda, it will keep on doing that all day long. No poet, no human poet in the world can match that. Creativity. In New York University, we were shown pictures drawn by human beings and AI and asked, can you identify which was done, done by human artist and one by AI? We could not. None of us could. Recently, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan, the MoMA. There, modern art, Metropol Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. There, what they have done is, they have fed the entire content of the museum. It's the most well-endowed museum of modern art in the world. They have fed the content of the entire museum to an AI and asked it to make modern art. And so when you enter that museum, you'll have this huge um, uh, you know, display, a screen, on which this AI is continuously generating art. I don't know how good an art it is, but it's hypnotic. I mean, you'll just, people are just gathered there staring at it. I stared at it. I was caught for um, a minute or two. Is it art? I don't know. Recently, a science fiction magazine stopped publishing. Why? Because they were receiving so many stories, science fiction stories, all written by AI. <laughs> it's a case, this is a magazine which had been predicting this, science fiction. You know, creative AI, and this has been like Frankenstein's monster, it came true. And first thing it destroyed was, you know, <laughs> the Asura who got the power of burning Basmashura to turn everything into ashes. And Shiva said, this is your power, I've given you this power. And Basmashura trial run beta testing, said, I let me touch you first. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that. But it's true. The first impact, you know, it's ironic. And telling, the first impact of AI is not on science. The first impact, amazingly, is on humanities. The first reaction to this chat GPT was from professors, um, uh, lecturers in the humanities departments. Essays written by the students. Nice assignments are being written. Essays are being written by the students, all by chat GPT. Now, how do you know which the student has written by himself or herself, or it's written by a computer? You don't know. Now they have, I was talking to some young uh, lecturers, not the senior people, the people who actually grade the papers and all, you know, the TAs and all. They said now they have to introduce um, AI to detect the AI used by the students. <laughs> they were having meetings in, in, uh, in uh, 
uh, among the professors in various departments, literature and uh, other humanities departments, to see what they could do. It's, it's already a crisis. It's already a crisis in humanities departments. Uh, creativity, intelligence, memory, senses, decision making. In, in San Francisco, if you see, you will see car, self-driven car. You are driving along in a car, you will see another car coming next to you, no driver. Sometimes no passenger. Sometimes no driver but passenger. Sometimes driver is there but hands are off the wheel. Car is driving by itself, probably better than you. Probably better than you. Now this AI is driving a car. That means decision making, sensing. Its sensors are much more powerful than any human being. It's aware of an entire area. Um, and so, now what I'm saying is, this is the point. That which we thought human beings could do, AI can do now. It can, what we thought hu only human beings can do, creativity. After all, all other kind of physical work can be done by machines. Calculators can do calculation and so on. But creativity, painting, writing, composing, we thought this is something that only human beings can do. Nobody else can do. Well, there's news for you. The machines can do it. And better than most other, um, you know, artists or writers, except the top few maybe. So machines are already doing it. What's my point in all this? Notice in this, all this talk, one thing is left out. There is one thing that AI cannot do, chat GPT cannot do, Google car cannot do. One thing, only one thing, consciousness. These machines, these programs, these cars are not conscious. This is Swami, how do you know? And don't take my word for it. Ask the experts, ask the Silicon Valley engineers who have programmed these machines. Ask them, sir, are your, uh, is your chat GPT, is your Google car, is it conscious? And they'll say, no, it's not conscious. We did not program it to be conscious. And not only that, we have no idea where to begin. We have no idea where to begin to make a program, an AI, conscious. Now, my question is this, why not? Why not? Creativity is complex. Intelligence is complex. Huh. Sensing is complex, decision making is complex. Consciousness is simple. Consciousness does only one thing and one thing only. It gives us first person experience, anubhava. That's all. Why can't you make the AI conscious? Why can't you make the Google car conscious? Not only that, not only why you cannot do, why can't you do it? Why is it that you don't even have any idea where to start also? There's no idea where to start. My point here is that this shows there is a distinct difference between consciousness and the rest of it. Creativity, they're connected, but there's a distinct difference. They are of different orders altogether. More of that as we go along. Um, there was this uh, professor of philosophy, Galen Strawson. It's a small world. He is the son of Sir Peter Strawson, our professor Arindam Chakravarti is guru, one of his gurus. <laughs> so Galen Strawson wrote this half humorous piece for New York Times. He said the hard problem of matter. He said, half humorously, that there is no hard problem of consciousness. We are all conscious, we know that. And then we think somehow this consciousness is being produced by the brain, we cannot explain how, and hence hard problem of consciousness. But you've already assumed that the consciousness is being produced by the brain. Why are you assuming this? And there's some reasons for that. He said it is actually matter which is mysterious. You are conscious. I am conscious. The universe appears to us in our consciousness. So what is this universe? That is the question. And physics probes that. What is matter? And then Galen Strawson goes on to show that matter is disappearing in our front of our very eyes. You know, from um, atoms to uh, quarks to super strings or whatnot, matter is becoming more and more mysterious. Consciousness is not mysterious at all. So, here we have the hard problem of consciousness. And this is directly related to, I think, the re-emergence of spiritual themes in the modern philosophy of mind. Indian philosophy. Evan Thompson, uh, in his book, Waking, Dreaming and Being, he starts with this statement, consciousness studies is not a new discipline. It's not, it did not start at the end of the 20th century. 
He says, consciousness studies started 5,000 years ago in India in the texts called the Upanishads. Evan Thompson writes that. And he goes on further to say, these Upanishads are so crucial in the history of human thought that we would do well to date history, not as AD, BC, but before Upanishad and after Upanishad. So, yeah, well, you might clap. I am a teacher of Vedanta. I teach, the philosophy I teach is based on the Upanishads. I would hesitate, the word, there's no real translation into English, lodja, <laughs> to, to make such, um, you know, uh, unconditional declarations. But it's coming from Shahib, so <laughs> Evan Thompson. That's, that's perfectly all right then. Uh, from the Upanishads, from Indian philosophy. Now, I haven't started my talk yet, but I, I promise to end in, in time. Now I'll go get into my talk. So, this, from this hard problem of consciousness, we are left with this question, what is consciousness? In Indian philosophy, what is this view, of, what is the view of consciousness? And particularly, we'll narrow it down to the Advaita Vedanta perspective of consciousness and wrap it up. Um, and why reality and reality plus, we'll wrap it up there. So very quickly, I'm going to do a TED Talk st <laughs> style presentation for the minutes, few minutes remaining to me. Okay. What is the Indian view of uh, consciousness uh, then? What is, so, you know, the answer would be, you know, the question would be, okay, wise guy, you've got our attention. Now, what's the answer? There is no one answer from Indian philosophy. One and one would be uh, suspicious if there was a very neat solution offered by Indian philosophy. There is a whole range of uh, answers given by different Indian philosophers. Just as a very quick sampling, let me take up five, uh, five broad approaches to consciousness in Indian philosophy. And by the way, this is just something I heard from a monk in Uttarakhand who said all of this, what I'm going to say now for the next 15 minutes, he said all of this in, um, uh, in two sentences, basically. <laughs> so, five broad approaches to philosophy, uh, to this problem of consciousness, hard problem of consciousness in Indian philosophy. What is the relationship between the object and consciousness? Brain is an object. So, what relationship is there? One uh, approach is, the first approach is, the object generates consciousness. Object generates consciousness. Brain is generating consciousness. This is the Charvaka, the naturalist in uh, Professor Chakravarti's talk. The Charvaka says, Pan, this is also untranslatable. Chewing beetle rolls in a tick, that's not quite right. Pan, when you chew a pan, there is no red color in any of the ingredients. In the your tongue becomes red. And the Charvaka says, there is no consciousness in the object. However, when the objects interact in a certain way, let us say in this body, let us say, they don't talk about the brain, but let us say in this brain and nervous system, when the objects interact in certain way, they produce something which was not there earlier, and that is consciousness. So that is uh, one approach, the Charvaka approach. And there, the hard problem of consciousness hits hard. Uh, because you cannot explain uh, something entirely subjective in terms of objective processes. This is what we were discussing till now, that hard problem of consciousness. The Charvaka view does not stand, and so the same thing comes down to today. Most of the scientists and philosophers opposed to this idea of consciousness as a fundamental reality, they would fall under this reductive Charvaka view. They try to say, somehow try to um, say that the brain is producing, somehow producing consciousness, promissory materialism and things like that. So that doesn't work. The second approach in uh, Indian philosophy is the opposite. Consciousness generates the object. Consciousness generates this material universe, including body and mind and everything. Uh, who says that? Every theistic religion says that. Any kind of theistic philosophy. Theism what do they say? One common um, feature of all theistic religions is that God is the creator. God has created this universe. And God has created all of us and this entire universe. Now if you ask 
your God, is this God a conscious God and unconscious God? You'll feel insulted. Of course it's a conscious God. So consciousness has created matter. This is the uh, second approach. And many, many philosophers, in some ways, Brahma Sutra, you know, uh, what is Brahman? Janmadhyasya yataha, asya jagata janmastiti bhanga yasma tad brahma. That is that ultimate reality from which the entire universe has emerged. So from your pure consciousness, this entire universe has emerged. A kind of theistic interpretation of that. The problem there again is, I mean, these are, I'm, I'm moving with very broad strokes. This is just a broad picture. The problem there would be um, atheism, agnosticism. Problem with God is, God is great, magnificent, if God exists. So the if God exists, that's the problem. <laughs> you can doubt, and people have doubted from ancient times till today, and the number of doubters of the existence of God is the maximum today. Somebody said, in no time in all of history have so many doubted the existence of the deity to such an extent. Uh, so doubt about the existence of God, that is the problem with the second approach, one of the problems. Alan Watts, not well known in India, but he's quite well known in the United States. He was a British philosopher, somebody put him this, this way. He was part philosopher, part pirate. <laughs> he operated in the uh, Bay Area near San Francisco in the 1950s and 60s. So he said if you separate God and the world, he calls it a crackpot theory. The idea of, you know, there is a reality which is called clay. So there is a clay and there is a pot. If you do that, then you end up with a crackpot theory. <laughs> you will end up chasing this idea, where is God? This question will keep on uh, haunting you. The third approach to this in Indian philosophy is uh, consciousness and object uh, are not that one has created the other. They are parallel realities. They are parallel realities. Consciousness exists, objects exist, universe exists, and a fundamental reality called consciousness exists. Immediately you will say, oh, Sankhya, Sankhya. Not just Sankhya, David Chalmers. So if you ask David Chalmers, so what is the solution to the hard problem of consciousness? He will say the solution is this, that you have to accept probably, he says you will have to probably accept that consciousness is a fundamental reality, it cannot be reduced to brain processes. In this universe, time, space, matter, energy, and consciousness. So consciousness is a fundamental reality, not to be reduced to some material basis. This, uh, he calls, it's an old theory in uh, Western philosophy also, called panpsychism. Panpsychism. That mind and consciousness are sort of all pervasive, ubiquitous. Some, of course, it's not widely accepted, but this is, he says, you're inevitably pushed to this, um, uh, to this conclusion. In fact, yeah, there was an interview when they asked David Chalmers about his belief in pan panpsychism. He said, if you think long and hard enough about the hard problem of consciousness, then you either become a panpsychist or you go into administration. <laughs> so, panpsychism today and Kapila Sankhya, Purusha and Prakriti, consciousness and matter. Vivekananda said that is the oldest human philosophy. Kapila was the first philosopher of the human race. So, that's one option. Patanjali Yoga, um, Sankhya, uh, consciousness and matter are fundamental realities and they interact. Where do they interact? In us. We are all interactions of consciousness and matter. The whole brunt of Professor Chakravarti's talk was, you know, the spirit and the natural side of the human being, the body and the, so the interaction of that. There is a, just for the sake of uh, sampling, a fourth approach to all of this. Take the Buddhistic approach and one of the Buddhistic schools, the Madhyamaka, the emptiness people, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, great names from the very ancient Hori past. So they, they will say, no, 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 no. Both consciousness and object, consciousness and this entire universe, both are empty. Sarvam Shunyam. Chandrakirti uses uh, the very telling example of two sheaves of hay leaning against each other. If you remove one, the other will fall. No Vedantin will use this example. Chandrakirti uses this. If you remove the object, where is consciousness? In deep sleep. Nothing is experienced. And where is the experience in consciousness? It's not there. 
and say, Swami, you have been telling us so many years that you are, you slept happily, you are the witness of the absence of all objects. But Chandrakirti, Nagarjuna, they would not be impressed by that argument. They would say, this is back calculation. You have woken up and then you are saying, there, is, there was some consciousness uh, experiencing the absence. No, no object, no consciousness. Both rise and fall together. Finally, the Advaita point of view is that the object is an appearance in consciousness. The object appears to consciousness, in consciousness, and is nothing but consciousness. So consciousness itself is appearing as its own object. One sadhu monk, he put it so simply and beautifully. What is the nature of the eye? It is to see. Now when the eyes look up into space, it can't it doesn't see space, it sees the sky, the child sees the sky as an inverted bowl. So you are seeing a surface where there is no surface, because the eye, the nature of the eye is to see. And he says exactly like that, the nature of consciousness is to experience. But there is nothing else to experience. Consciousness alone is. So it experiences itself as its own object. So that's the Advaita Vedanta perspective. Now in the last few minutes remaining to me, I will sketch a pathway, in, I promise to finish in time, I'll sketch a pathway from our present uh, scientific mainstream perspective to the Advaita Vedanta perspective. And this will be done in five steps, five negations. Each of these negations does a huge amount of philosophical heavy lifting. You can, not only us, but philosophers have fought over this for thousands of years, both in the East and the West. Each step is a dramatic step, a dramatic negation, and there are huge philosophical controversies. But I'll just outline this path. What is the path? Where are we going? From our present understanding, scientific materialism, materialistic reductive understanding, or lack of understanding, to the Advaitic perspective in five negations. Step one, consciousness is not brain. Step two, consciousness is not mind. Step three, Consciousness is not an object. Step four, consciousness is not many. And finally, consciousness is not two. Advaitam, non-dual. Five steps. First, consciousness is not brain. All that we, I said till now, all the discussion on the hard problem of consciousness is this first step. And I'm so glad that we are living in a time when this first step is being, if not taken, at least is being seriously proposed. Until 20, 25 years ago, people refused to talk about consciousness in the scientific community. And now they are taking it very seriously. And even the possibility that maybe consciousness is not the brain. It's not just David Chalmers. Uh, there is uh, Donald Hoffman, Bernardo Karstrup, and many others. Philip Goff, uh, many others who um, hold similar views. So the first step is not just an Advaita Vedanta perspective. I wonder if I can say this. He mentioned a dialogue with Deepak Chopra. Now, I can see some people rolling their eyes, but anyway, he's a good guy. <laughs> now, there's a difference between a stage persona and in the green room. So in the green room, when we were speaking, he said, Swamiji, these people, by which he meant these people. So they're, they're taking our views and not giving credit to it. Uh, you know, Vedanta, Sankhya views, and not giving credit, enough credit to us. I said, Deepak Ji, that's great. That's really great. If somebody who is not some, a spiritual seeker, who is not interested in Indian philosophy, who is a neuroscientist, or a philosopher of mind in NYU, coming entirely from an agnostic perspective, coming entirely from a materialistic, reductive perspective, is forced to the conclusion that consciousness cannot be reduced to a material basis, that's much better then somebody saying, oh, I read it in the Upanishads or I heard it from my Lama or something and this is the... No, no, no. Yeah. So it's much better that way. Consciousness is not the brain. This is step one. Still, a lot of argument, a lot of work to be done on this. But we must go further now. We cannot stay here. We must go further. Consciousness is not the mind. And this follows from phenomenologically. We can see ourselves right now. We have defined consciousness as not this. If you can use this, then it's not consciousness. Can you say this thought, this idea, this memory? Of course you can say that. And therefore, our, the contents 
of our minds, our minds are not consciousness by themselves. So this distinction between mind and consciousness is not clear in the modern philosophy of mind. Uh, when I was doing the readings in the philosophy of mind, I saw a number of tangles which can be easily untangled if this distinction between mind and consciousness is maintained. And this distinction between mind and consciousness was a staple in Indian philosophy. For thousands of years, almost every school made a clear distinction between mind and consciousness. Between consciousness and its contents, not just perceptions, the world outside, but thoughts. Generally in the philosophy of mind, mind and consciousness are taken together in the modern philosophy of mind. Consciousness is not mind. Step, th step three, then what is consciousness? If it's not the world, if it's not the body, if it's not this, then what is consciousness? Consciousness is not an object. This is another even more dramatic step forward. The reason why people are finding it very difficult, scientists and philosophers, to deal with consciousness is because of this very elusive nature of consciousness. One very famous philosopher said consciousness is transparent. But in that very language, consciousness is transparent, is still the seed of the idea it's some kind of object. You know, like you can't look through a wall, but you can look through glass. Glass is transparent. Consciousness is transparent. It's not like that also. It's not an object. Hume, David Hume, he said, what is this self people talk about? When I experience my uh, inner states, I find perceptions, I find judgments, um, memories. But there is no sense of I, what, what corresponds to that sense of I? I don't find a self. And Vedanta would say here is, dear David Hume, you are looking in the wrong place. You're trying to find the self as an object. That's why you can't find it. You cannot find it, not because it doesn't exist. It's because you're looking in the wrong place. The one which is looking is the self. This idea that there can be something that is not an object, this is not easily accepted. Uh, mainly because we live in a very uh, scientific world, a world where objective is equal to real. Uh, Vedanta reverses it. Subject is the reality to which the uh, object appears. I think um, Galen Strawson would <laughs> agree to that. So it's not an object. Consciousness is not an object. It's, an, it's that to which all objects appear. Further, now we are going to go even further. We are going to take leave of Sankhya also. How many consciousnesses? There is consciousness, uh, does it have a plural or not? And Advaita Vedanta would say, and Gita Krishna says, Kshetragyam chapi mam vidhi sarvakshetre shubharata. In all these fields, there is but one knower of the field. And I am that. In all these material beings, there is one consciousness, one knower, one experiencer, uh, one consciousness. So consciousness is not many. And here we are parting ways with multiple Indian philosophies. Multiple Indian philosophies. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Purva Mimamsa. Uh, we are parting ways. Multiple schools of Buddhism. Is saying consciousness is one. And there are many arguments and counter-arguments to this. And finally, here is the dramatic reversal. Where what we have, notice, we have excluded everything from consci consciousness. World is not consciousness. The body is not consciousness. Sensations and thoughts are not consciousness. There are not many consciousnesses. We have excluded everything. In the final step, it's reversed. Everything is taken back into consciousness. Consciousness is not two. That which is other than, seems to be other than consciousness is nothing but consciousness itself. That's why non-dual, advaitam. Everything is appearing to consciousness, but, you know, Swami Brahmananda said, that, can you show me the line dividing consciousness and the world? You'll actually find no line dividing consciousness and the world, even phenomenologically. The entire universe is appearing in consciousness. That which is appearing in consciousness and cannot be expressed as other than consciousness, it must be somehow consciousness itself. So this entire universe is uh, an appearance in consciousness, consciousness real, universe appearance, and that's where Advaita, classical Advaita Vedanta stops. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. What am I? Real or an appearance? You are real. You are consciousness itself. As consciousness, you are the reality to which the world, body, mind are all appearances. 
So this is the non-dual nature of consciousness. Five negations. Consciousness is not brain, not mind, not object, not many, not two. One last word and I'm, I'm done. The subject of this uh, talk, uh, reality and reality plus. So reality plus is the name of David Chalmers' latest book. What he has done there is, he says, this virtual world we have created. You have phones, social media, um, then there is simulations, all of that. And we have this world where we are sitting. They are seamlessly working together. We are creating this virtual world right now. now what is it called? Meta. So all of these things are there now. He says now, we have these two worlds. My real world and that virtual world. And he says, why? Consider that also as real. That's an extended reality. Uh, reality plus. And that's the theme of his book. He calls it techno-philosophy. Basically what he has done is taken up these old questions of philosophy. What is real? How do we know? What's the point of it all? And it, it examines it in terms of the new technology of virtual reality and AI and all. And comes up with very in interesting observations. But what I'm taking away from that is this. Notice how he collapsed, he synthesized these two worlds, real world, virtual world, into one world and he calls it reality plus. We are living in reality plus. In Advaita Vedanta, it struck me, you still, there's a tension. Consciousness and appearance. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. This is realization. You have come to reality when you realize the non-dual consciousness. But there's also the counterpart to it, the falsity, the appearance. That falsity, this world appearance, body, universe, our activities in the world, these are also nothing but Brahman. Brahman alone, consciousness alone is appearing in all of these ways instead of regarding it as appearance. If you regard consciousness, Brahman as the reality, you regard consciousness world as reality plus. So this is you, the consciousness, non-dual consciousness, experiencing reality plus. Or in Sri Ramakrishna's language, popularized, Huh? Vigyana, yes, somebody was saying by Swami Medhananda, the Vigyana version of non-dualism. Brahman is real, consciousness is real, there is a whole realm of appearance to consciousness, but consciousness appearance together, nothing other than consciousness, what Sri Ramakrishna called Brahma Shakti, the idea of Vigyana, can we call it reality plus. What David Chalmers has done is, he has merged the the Vyavaha, I'm using Vedantic terms now, Vyavaharika and Pratibhasika, and is calling it reality plus. Can we merge Pratibhasika, Vyavaharika, and with the, in the ground with uh, uh, the Paramarthika, and you call that reality plus. So, Tattvam Asi, you are that, would mean you are that reality plus. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you very much. Yes. Sir, before he takes over, uh, there is an announcement. Maharaj Sarvapyanandu would be speaking at Bibek Tirtho on 7th at 6 p.m. Sunday. 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 Yes, this Sunday, coming Sunday. So you are all expected there. 7th? <laughs> January at 6 p.m to be held at the Vivek Tirtho Hall there. No, Gold Park, Vivek Tirtho. So thank you very much to Swami Sarvapyanji for his stirring keynote address. Every time I listen to Swami Sarvapyanji, I can only marvel at his incredible gift for making the most difficult, the most profound, the most complex philosophical ideas, not just accessible, but living and urgent and entertaining, downright entertaining to everybody, including non-academics. So this is a rare gift and 
I know that we're all very grateful to him for sharing his gift with us this evening. Thank you to Professor Nirmalo Narayan Chakraborty as well for his wonderful keynote address today. And I think this is, these two keynote addresses are probably the best way to kick off this three-day international philosophy seminar. There's a lot more to come in the next two days, so please stay tuned and stay with us. Thank you also to revered Swami Suparnananda Ji Maharaj for hosting us here. He's the head of the center and he's been very generous and very supportive throughout. Let's give him a big round of applause. And a thanks too to Swami Tadvratananda Ji Maharaj. He keeps telling me, don't thank me, don't thank me, but I insist on thanking him. He has been the one working tirelessly behind the scenes to make this seminar uh, possible in the first place and a, and a real success. So thank you very much to him as well. A thanks in absentia to Professor Anand Vaidya. It's unfortunate that he can't be here today. And as I said, let's all keep him in our prayers. Let's give him a big round of applause. And thank you all to all the presenters who are sitting here in the front row who will be speaking in the next two days. And thank, thank you to all of you. Half of you are now leaving because you're afraid that you're going to get stuck in traffic. Uh, so thank you for, for attending. And we'll end with a mantra. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu